esteemed colleagues, please welcome to the City Science stage, Kent Larson, the director of MIT City Science. All right, welcome back. Uh, I hope everybody had a good time yesterday. We had fun, a little crazy, but we, we, we had a good time, and I hope people got something out of the event. Well, today, it's all about the network. It's about uh, digging into some of the issues that hopefully we uncovered a bit yesterday. Uh, yeah, so this is the day two of, uh, of the City Science Summit. Uh, if you joined us yesterday, you heard us present two key themes. One, cities are central to any solution with respect to climate change. We used Kendall Square as a case study. We looked at those solutions that could optimize not only the en environmental impact, but the social and the economic impact. And we looked at opportunities to rebuild Kharkiv as a model for not only Kharkiv and Ukraine, but hopefully cities globally. So these topics are really essential to what we do in city science to enable communities that are much more livable and equitable and resilient. And there are many other key themes for our work that we need to drill down into. And today we're joined by the directors of the City Science Network and our other important collaborators to share ideas, discuss what issues and challenges we might face in the future. We'll hear from three panels to kick the day off. They're each discussing their communities, their research labs, the critical challenges that they're facing. Uh, and in addition to the guests that are joining us, I'd like to thank two colleagues who were not here to join us in person, Professor Yao from Taipei Tech and Professor Lo from Tongji University. By the way, I got, a, I got an email from Lo today saying that he watched the whole event yesterday online. You have to realize he's in Shanghai. The event started at 1.30 a.m., so that's pretty amazing. And he's vice president of the university, so he has a lot of uh, other things on his plate. Um, so we're grateful for the leadership of all the directors of the affiliated city science labs around the world and um, for their creativity. And um, we look forward to um, continuing the conversations and taking all our work in new and hopefully impactful directions. So now uh, I want to Welcome to the stage, um, our first panel. So thank you to the City Science Network for all your creative research and the support you give us. And we look forward to just marvelous things in the future. So first panel, welcome. Hi, everyone. Uh, as you might know, I'm Andres Rico. I'm a PhD student at the lab. Uh, I work, I've had the privilege of working with both uh, Andorra and Guadalajara. Um, and I usually do sensing systems, as you might know. Uh, I've put sensors on everything that moves uh, except humans. Um, worked on the ocean, on the mountains, and uh, on bikes. Uh, so it's, it's great to be here, and I hand it off to, to Mayra. Hi, thank you. Hi, my name is Mayra Gamboa. I'm professor of urban design and planning at the University of Guadalajara, and I'm the director of the laboratory in Guadalajara with this collaboration between MIT Group and the City Science. Um, uh, very pleased to be here after two years of meeting online, so very glad, and um, I would like to share some of the things that we are working on in our lab and the current challenges we are facing uh, also with uh, all these uh, problems that are common for Latin American cities as well. Thank you very much. And I'm uh, Jordi Asensi Sala. I come from Andorra, from the Andorra Research and Innovation Agency. I'm the head of technology and the project management office. And uh, as you can see, uh, we are full of snow, not right now, but it will start <laughs> snowing uh, probably next week 
in Andorra, and uh, I'm very glad to be here with all these colleagues and friends and to put some 3D on the 2D meetings that we had in the last two years. Uh, we came, uh, four of us, uh, Vanessa and uh, Aurora and Jan that are here, and we will be really happy to have you in our workshop, the ones that you will come. And, uh, well, just start the discussion because uh, <laughs> I think that uh, it will be great. So 50 years ago, the Club of Rome uh, commissioned a team of MIT researchers um, to think about or ask them to think about um, sustainability in a holistic way, integrating how we're producing, how we're consuming. Um, and the outcome of this was a report called the, the Limits of Growth. And I would like to uh, have you, Jordi, uh, tell us a bit of the highlights of the, the, the Limits of Growth uh, paper, but also why they're relevant today and how we can think of them uh, towards the next 50 years. Yeah, you know, when I was thinking about, about this panel, uh, I was thinking, what, what will we talk about? You know, and uh, we are uh, thinking about sustainability and how the, uh, the uh, urban environment takes its price to sustainability. And uh, just looking, you know, about uh, what were the, the situation in, uh, in other cities, and I, I just came by for this, this, uh, this project that uh, it was made not far from here. In fact, I think that way, you know, in the, at the MIT. And I thought to myself, reading the, the report, why, what happened? So 50 years ago, a bunch of people from the MIT prepared a very wonderful uh, report using the uh, state-of-the-art technology and, and, and science, showing something that it won't be so different than today. <laughs> so what happened? Uh, and what did not happen? Because at the very end, this is the question that we have. It's they, they, they put a very specific report where they say, we have problems. If we grow that way, we will empty the planet. You know? And uh, we you should think differently. We should act differently in order to to be in this planet and to have this planet livable for us. And uh, 50 years later, we are almost in the same situation. So what happened? And uh, to me, and I think this is super important, the, the, the name of the, this summit, you know, the hyper-local uh, solutions for global challenges. And probably the thing is that we should think more locally. So. Yesterday, we had a fantastic panel with, uh, about Kendall Square and also about Kharkiv. And the good thing about that was that using top science, you know, brilliant minds, but also local people, we found a way to create a real impact in each and every one of the communities and different ones because the solutions that we are thinking in Kharkiv, probably they will be applied in other cities but with a specific touch. And to me, I think my first thoughts will be, first, you should find kind of a suitable framework that applies to your city, to your environment, to your community. And then you give it a steady support. Because uh, on, the, on the times that we are running right now, that all is quick and fast, and you know, you, you, you react and, and, and in, in tweet time, you know. These things, they, they take time, it's long term. It's not the, something that you will do in, in, in 10 minutes or in one year. You need more than that. So you give it time. Uh, you have the global goal in mind. I, and I think this is important in the, the UN, the SDGs, for, uh, for instance. You know, they give you uh, this main idea, this main uh, landscape of where you should go. And, and after that, you share and exchange. And this is what we're doing right now, you know, sharing with you all together with each, each and every one of us uh, talking about our personal insights and maybe giving some advice or some information to other people. And we were doing that with Myra yesterday and the other, all the people that we met yesterday too. And then you test, you interact, you, uh, you, you iterate, and you, you think about and you, know, you do this process continuously. And I think it's about surgical precision, leadership, and giving it time. Just my first thoughts about that. Perfect. <laughs> so I'm going to put a pin on, on, on the relevance that you said about um, hyper-local 
solutions and engaging with the community. And I think that Guadalajara is one of the labs that uh, <laughs> engages the most with the community. And um, it's, it's almost like 95% of the time uh, dealing with the community. So I want to yeah. hear from you, Mayra, to tell us um, how you see the importance of hyperlocal uh, solutions, the engagement with the community, and also um, how you do it in the lab. Because uh, I, I know there's many special processes that you use. Yes, that's one of uh, our main focus uh, in the laboratory, like um, working with the community, also uh, playing an academic role of doing this uh, implementation of uh, really uh, make uh, research apply to improve some of the conditions of uh, communities. Because, uh, yeah, w I like that we have a start with this um, reflection regarding what has uh, gone with these uh, 50 years since the report was written. And actually, yeah, the conditions and the challenges, uh, they, are, they still remain. Maybe uh, some are even worse. And yeah, so what were the limits that uh, that report uh, put, it, put it out? Uh, the limits were the existing resources at that time. And we have seen that with improvement of technology, we are always pushing, <laughs> pushing forward those, those limits, like uh, the scarce of uh, land for agriculture, f for instance. Uh, well, we have developed hydroponics, aeroponics, so now, now that, that is not exactly a, a limit. So we are overcoming these uh, thresholds and, and challenges and also limits for urban growth with skyscrapers, etc. And But we have seen that there, there are still some challenges that technology cannot uh, tackle that. And some of them is the increase of inequality, you know? These inequalities that we see in cities, um, cities are, or urban, uh, the population is becoming urban. In Latin America, is 80% uh, of the population is urban, but, uh, and this, well, is it, expected to increase in the following uh, years. And the rapid urbanization that is going to happen also mainly in countries of Africa, and Asia, and Latin America, is growing in these very poor conditions. So what we can do, because uh, governments are always like struggling with this, with planning and behind uh, this increase of growth and all the environmental impacts that, that we face. So, um, we think we really think that improving capabilities of the community we could uh, help out people to make it more sustainable communities you know, in terms of using uh, better or implementing better ways to use resources and yeah trying to make uh, all this process in a circular economy with no waste that will be something that will help really for um, uh, these uh, environmental issues. Um, so yeah, uh, I think the question is what kind of transformation we could implement in order to tackle down with these uh, challenges. And this is what we are uh, do doing in the laboratory and we are going to present after in this uh, workshop and related with food production, which is one of the issues that this report also uh, highlighted 50 years ago. Perfect. <laughs> yes. So I'm going to stick with the resource uh, part of, of, of the answer. And um, as, as the sensors guy at the lab, <laughs> I like <laughs> to measure things. And I think that these measurements could inform, in the end, uh, the relationship that we have with the resources. So with uh, LOMAS, we're working in, with water. We've worked with uh, mm -hmm. Andorra, for example, for the preservation of the mountains with the skis. Mm -hmm. So I wanted to get an answer from both of you of what do you think um, these technologies or the interventions that are needed to better understand and, and preserve the resources that are relevant to each one of, of the communities that uh, you're in? Well, in our case, uh it's funny because uh, we are using the uh, sensors uh, in different ways. We, we use the uh, cell phones to uh, 
geolocate the tourists. Our population is 80,000 people. That is not a lot, but we receive 8 million tourists per year. So this mm -hmm. creates a huge impact into the country. So uh, when you study the movements on, uh, of the tourists in the country, you can see what are the behavior and uh, you can act uh, in a way that will be more sustainable because you know where are they moving and what, what they're doing. Uh, at the same time, this information, uh, we, we can share it with our touristic agency to know what if the, the impact of the uh, touristic campaigns and the actions that they do to attract people to the country. But uh, these are, if you wish, these are the, the, the technical information and it's, it's fine. But now we are, what we are doing is uh, using sensors, uh, artificial sensors, if you wish, but also uh, biological sensors, the butterflies, the, uh, the quality of the water of the lakes to measure the impact of climate change. And we are crossing all this information all together to have more information to, to make better decisions. But at the same time, and, and, and I will take one, one, one sentence from Myra, what you're doing with well, Alahara is a participatory process. Mm -hmm. So we are sensing also the people, asking the people, what about, you know, different issues that we have. Uh, last year we did uh, uh, one thing that is, uh, we, we, we gathered 150 people uh, and we started what we call the uh, Andorra Tables of the Future. So what will be the Andorra of the two, uh, 2050? You know, and, uh, and this was a way to sense also the, the, the implications. So this information I think is useful too and we put it in our databases and we work together, you know. And uh, in the case, specific case for Andorra, and we will show that in our workshop, we, we created, can, we use the framework from UNESCO, the Men and the Biosphere Program, and it's a specific program, but at the same time, we want to engage the people that, you know, into this program to know what is happening. So it's, in a way, it's, it's sensing again. If you don't have data, you, if you don't have information, you're just, you know, it's wet finger estimation. You know, it's, it's, uh, you, you can have a guess of, about what to do, but if you have information from, our, from sensors, from biological sensors, from the people, I think that the decisions that you make are better. But again, and the, we face all political issues, and the political times are not the same that the research times. And uh, let me make a kind of a pledge. We're friends here. <laughs> so I think that... We researchers, people from science, we are the ones that we should, like, we have the duty to show that data, that information, it's useful to, you know, to, to create this real change. The people that are in politics, they are, you know, in four or five years mandates, and sometimes, you know, the day-by-day -day basis is complicated. So with all this data that you are gathering, with all the information, these hypotheses and the testing and the, you know, testing in, in, in different labs, etc. I think that we, we should take that as, a, as, a, as gold to show to mm -hmm. the people that it's possible, this change. You know, to me, at least, is if we do that, if we don't do that, you know, nev no one will do it, you know. So we are, we can, we have this kind of duty to use this information to make the, the world change, you know, to apply these hyper-local solutions to this global challenge. <laughs> Yeah. Um, I changed your, uh, your, your speech. I ended it probably, right? <laughs> no, what I was going to say is after working four years with uh, communities, and yeah, we have some findings and uh, learnings uh, about yeah, engaging the, the community. Mm. It's really important with uh, these um, uh, collaborations and this work because, uh, yeah, we, you can have very good intentions, but sometimes <laughs> the outcomes here is not as you plan. So, uh, yeah, we, you cannot, like, develop the technology and think, like, if you bring this technology to the community, they will just be very happy to have it and work with it. Uh, you, you, you really have to work with them since the very beginning because uh, they are to appropriate these uh, technologies and to make them really useful and match their needs because otherwise, if they don't see that benefit, which is immediate, 
then they will have to worry about other things, the daily life that they have to um, be aware of what they are going to eat, that they, so uh, it's really a process of uh, working very close. And yeah, that's, that's some of the things that we have learned. And also uh, the university is a, a key, a key stakeholder also, uh, like not only in terms of development technology, but in terms of doing this very link collaboration with students, community, and faculty, and involving also uh, other leaders and the municipality and the private sector, because it's really hard. Nobody wants to fund the poor, so we have to push to develop some incentives that could allow to implement some cross subsidies that could allow to relocate some resources in this type of community. So that's a, a really hard work that we have also to push. I think that's a key role from the university to tackle down these uh, challenges as well. Completely, and then navigating all of the yes. changes within uh, the community, the university, and make aligning that is not is not easy. But I think you've always done yeah. a really good job. I think it. the technology should help out to not only to uh, tackle down the the challenges of the limits of road. <laughs> that's that's wonderful, and we have been done a good job. But also, technology should help out to make more equitable cities as well, you know, to try to uh, make or find this equilibrium that we are looking for. So we have two minutes, and I'll ask for a one-minute pitch of each of you of what you would add um, to the report uh, for the next 50 years uh, as key characteristics or challenges that need to be solved to, to reach uh, that sustainability or sustainable behavior that uh, we're seeking. I'll go. I'll go with the easy one. You know, <laughs> the hyperlocal. It's so suitable. You know, it's it's so uh, specific. Take into account your local environment. You know, to know uh, where your your context and because uh, at the end. You know, you can do kind of what we call in, in Spanish, we bring this to the sun, you know, hey, the toast to the sun. Okay. <laughs> but uh, the reality is in every in community and in every neighborhood and in every city and in every country are different. And uh, of course, there is kind of a baseline. But you think you need to go into the matrices, you know, to go there and to find and to see what is happening and, and to act taking into account this specific context. I think that, to me, it will be at the very end of the report, take into account your specific context. Yeah, to me, it's, uh, well, uh, yeah, going to hyper-local solutions, it starts with us, <laughs> like changing our behaviors, because it's, uh, I think, the main step that we could take out, like, um, well, analyzing really from our Sales from our family. What are the our consumption patterns? Current uh, patterns. I think yesterday there was a lot of reflection about all the strategies that we can make in, in terms of producing less CO2 uh, to, uh, emissions. And yeah, it, it starts from our behavior, what we eat, when <laughs> how we use water, energy, and all these kind of sources, and then trying to replicate those in the large scale with communities and yeah but going from uh, bottom up to the bigger plans no <laughs> perfect yes. that's a good note to end the panel in and introduce our next guest the guests but thank you so much for being with us and we invite you to both of the workshops uh, they're going to be quite interesting yeah. um, later on today thank you thank you Nice to have you both here, and hi, everyone. Um, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Maggie Church, and I'm the program coordinator here at MIT City Science. Um, as an administrative person on the team, my focus is very different. So you've met a bunch of our researchers, you've heard from Kent, um, and on the administrative side, we're really looking at the sort of day-to-day -day workings of the lab. 
but we also focus a lot on the community. So who are the people that we need to bring together? How can we start those conversations? Um, and how can we have sort of the best collaborations moving forward? So we thought it would be cool to bring together two other people who are very focused on community and sort of talk about what that means to us and to our organizations. So I'm here today with Ariane Bertrand and Fernando Perez. Ariane, if you could introduce yourself. Yeah, um, so my name is Ariane and I'm the director of Thriving Communities at Emerson Collective. Um, and I think we were gonna share a little bit about why we do the work. Yeah, tell us um, and so I think for me, it's, it's, it's really personal. You know, I fundamentally believe that people should have access to clean and healthy communities and have opportunities to learn and to grow and, and to do something to contribute to their communities. And, uh, you know, if you have sort of fundamental basic human rights of shelter and water and food, then you really have the space to, to think about your future and, and to construct that future. Um, and I think that everyone has the capacity to build a just and equitable world. But unfortunately, there's a lot of communities that have been overlooked and systematically disinvested in. And so that's something that we really need to work on to change. And, um, you know, I hope that I can be of service to these communities and sort of do something to move those goals forward. So that's really sort of how we approach the work that we do in East Palo Alto, which is a community in the heart of Silicon Valley in California. Awesome, thank you for being here. Um, Fernando, do you wanna tell us who you are and then also why do you do what you do? Yeah, my name is Fernando Perez. I'm uh, representing the City Lab Bio Bio, that is the new lab uh, that is just two weeks ago, we signed the, the contracts. Uh, so we are the new ones. Um, and also I'm the project director of the Corporación Ciudades, that is a nonprofit organization that works in projects related with urban design and city planning, uh, with a special focus on participatory process. Um, and yeah, we strongly believe in, like, in, in community participation as the first step to build uh, a sustainable uh, city and sustainable projects. Uh, and what we do, or basically we work in the corporation, is trying to bring people uh, from different sectors, from publics, from private academics, um, people like neighbors, regular people, people that use the city, that walk in the walkside, that use the transport every day, uh, sitting in the same table mm -hmm. just to talk, to discuss, and trying to find some common point to build the city that we want to live in the next few years. Yeah, wonderful. And this is a great moment for us because it's really a celebration. We're so grateful to have the City Science Lab um, from Chile as part of the network now. And this has been a collaboration with multiple partners. I know you're here from Corporación Ciudades, but also the Cámara Chilena de la Construcción has been in a really important player, um, as is the government of Bio Bio and also Chile Mas. They're an organization that bring together um, the organizations and the people in Chile with the organization here at MIT and in greater Boston. Um, but we always say we need like-minded partners. That's an essential part of working together. So you'll hear as we discuss today that this is brand new. There's no research ongoing with you yet, but because of the way that you're thinking about your community and your work, we're really excited to work with you moving forward. Mm -hmm. And from your side, Ariane, I think we've been working together for two years or so now, so it's still sort of a newer collaboration. There's still sort of work emerging there, but at the same time, we've gotten to know each other a bit better and sort of dig into some of those issues. Um, we've, we've been talking a lot about what's important to us and that community keeps coming back to us. And in particular, I think the community voice. I know that you both spend time talking to the people in the place, whether it's directly with the citizens, also with stakeholders, also in terms of policy. So I'd love to start us off and talk about um, who are the community, what are you hearing, what's important in the places where you're working. Well, we hear a lot from the community. Yeah. <laughs> they have, you know, a lot to say because it, it is where they live, it's what they've built. Um, and I think there's quite a lot of fear of change, of, you know, people coming in, making promises, not fulfilling those promises. Um, 
you know, feeling like there's all these benefits that are coming, but that the, the current residents aren't necessarily the ones that are, are benefiting from those. So there's a lot of conversation around, you know, how, how are you going to make this project different? Mm -hmm. And how are you actually going to bring these benefits to, to us as a community? But I think there's also an optimism, right? There's, there's a, a desire to create a new future. There's a, a desire to bring in innovation. There's a desire to, to create more opportunities for collaboration and community to come together. So there's kind of always this tension of like, yeah, you, you've told us this before, or we've heard this from other people, but then there is this opportunity, and so I think we're constantly um, trying to listen. I yeah. mean, it's, it's really about listening and relationship building. Um, and there's also a desire really to preserve, right? There's a culture and a history that's been built in these communities. And it's really important that that's not erased, that, it, that for the, the desire to have, you know, better, more sustainable kind of communities that you wipe out what you've had and start new. That's that's not what they want. Yeah. So how do you how do you build with what you have? Make sure that it's integrated and that really reflects that community. So I think you know we're constantly talking, we're constantly listening, and then trying to build this trust so that they. They really tell us genuinely what it is that they want. We also have to be very genuine about what it is we can do mm -hmm. and what, it, what expectations we're setting. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's creating space for conversation. It's, it's really allowing the community to guide the process um, and, and hopefully building something that everyone is excited about. Yeah. Yeah, I think it's so awesome to have you here because you're in the work. So, you know, when you're able to talk about, you know, establishing trust, we see that a lot too. And trust is already broken down sometimes when you're in a new relationship. So having ways to bring people together and to build that relationship is really important and really challenging. Um, but I also love that you approach it from a place of listening. Um, I think that probably gives a lot more insight into the work that you're doing and we can learn from you as we see you kind of doing that moving forward. Um, and I know, uh, Fernando, you're probably spending time listening too. I know you guys do workshops in Chile with the citizens. What's it like and yeah. what do they think? Yeah, I think first I, I, ask, I, I have to tell you like, like the context of Chile today. Um, and, and as you may know, we have a, like a huge social uprising in mm -hmm. Chile three years ago. Um, that, that with a lot of protests all over the country that make that today we are discussing uh, our new constitution. Uh, and I think from my point of view, this is basically because people are tired of wait uh, for projects, are tired of uh, master plans and ideas. Uh, they want to see realistic things. They want to touch projects. Uh, and that is something that is so complicated for us because they uh, actually don't trust mm -hmm. in our work and they don't want to wait anymore. And they have a lot of problems, and, and we need to accelerate the process. Mm -hmm. uh, so probably the first challenge that we are going to confront uh, with the city lab and, and that we are confronting now with the Corporación Ciudades is trying to build trust again and, and try to make people uh, see us as a partner. Mm -hmm. and, and related probably with the most relevant issues, uh, today we have uh, mobility problems, we have um, social problems, very, very important social problems, uh, and natural disaster. We live with natural disaster every year. Every year so. and, and also, uh, we have a huge um, housing shortage, and we, we need a lot of house. And, and actually, the government, a few months ago, uh, promoted a new plan uh, trying to build, that promotes to build, uh, something like 260,000 new houses in the next uh, four years. And, and, and this is something that is, is, is make us feel a little worried because they talk about build houses in a very fast um, time and, and, and nobody talk about build cities, mm -hmm. build, build neighborhoods and to include people into this process because uh, we think that to create sustainable places, to create a neighborhood where people can feel proud of, the first step is to listen what they want, what is the type of place that they want to live. 
Um, and yeah, I think that it probably is, is, is one of the most difficult things that we're going to face in yeah. the next few years. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. You know, I think that there's no way that mm -hmm. a team could ever go to a place like that and just understand it. It's so incredibly complex, both places really. So having collaborations has been essential to how we work. So knowing people that are even explaining a bit of what's going on as we work together mm -hmm. and really guiding everyone through the process and having those other players working with you as well. So. Um, you're both, I'm sure, saying things that are also resonating with other people in the City Science Network yeah. who are also working in this way in their countries. And we always say each place is so unique. We see incredibly unique places, you know, both in East Palo Alto and in Chile and Bio Bio and in other places. But there's these commonalities that come up too in the way people are working and sort of the way people are doing the work so that we can learn from one another. Yeah. I, I think actually Fernando brought up something that's also interesting to grapple with, which is this notion of time. Yeah. You know, and when and when you're talking with communities, there's there's sort of the immediate and 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 sort of the fear that's happening, but you're talking about projects that take 10, 15, yeah. 20 years yes. and there's policy that needs to be changed and how you sort of manage that and you're phasing things and maybe some housing will be built but not enough and people get upset. So that notion of also bringing people along and, and that timeline and understanding how things are sequenced is also really challenging. Yeah, I wonder even, like, how do you stay focused or how do you stay hopeful when you're looking at these immense challenges? You know, I, we also want to touch on impact and what you think might be possible in your communities, but how, how do you guys stay focused and see the vision over the length of time that you're putting in? Do you want me to you go, go first? <laughs> go, Fernando. <laughs> Well, uh, the impact, I, I think if I have to summarize like the three main ideas that we hope uh, to get in, in the next few years, uh, and especially with the collaboration of the City Lab, is that we hope to accelerate process in Chile. I think people cannot still wait in anymore uh, and then they need solutions in, in a short period of time. Uh, secondly, I think we hope to help uh, stakeholders to take right decisions. Mm -hmm. uh, today in Chile, a lot of stakeholders take uh, decisions um, based on what they thought, of the f their feelings, their intuitions. Uh, and, and I think the City Lab is, is going to help our stakeholders to take decisions based on science and that the data. And, and that is, I think that could be a huge advance in, in our case. And finally, we, we hope to promote more um, inclusive process, yes. more democratic, uh, more diverse participatory process. Uh, we hope that the City Lab help us to try to explain difficult things in an easy language sure. and, and try to, uh, because I think it's the only way to bring more people into these topics and, and it, the only way to create more uh, friendly cities. Yeah, yeah of yeah. course. Yeah, and I, th I think for us, impact sort of has two big buckets. One sort of being this notion that, you know, we're, we're, we're not a real estate, a commercial real estate company. We're a social justice organization that happens to have purchased some land with the intention of trying to do development in a different way. And so I think one of our, our goals is really, can we influence the way development is done? Can we learn what are the levers of displacement? Can we understand what are the balances? How, you know, how much profit do you actually have to make? How much can you give back to the community? Can you have co-ownership? What are some new models we can build? And, and we hope that that can influence the developers around us. And, and we're seeing that already that's happening because we're all vying for the city's approval and, and attention at the same time. But if we're pushing for more community benefits, if we're pushing for community engagement from the beginning, then the other developers kind of have to do the same thing in order to be competing. Mm -hmm. um, so that's kind of one of the ways that we're trying to, to think about impact. And then I think secondly and more importantly is really building the capacity of the community to advocate for itself. So what are, what's the information? What's the knowledge? You know, as you mentioned, sort of how do you bring community into processes that are quite complex? Um, 
um, that they often feel excluded from, and, yeah. and what's the information and the knowledge that they need to be able to really go into those meetings and advocate and, and, and get the outcomes that they want. Yeah, that's interesting. It's not just listening, it's building capacity. So it's really um, it providing empowerment, but having a way to go through that process so that everyone can be there with you. Do you want to touch on what you've done with the MIT team so far? I know you're looking at some things that are related to the way that community functions, and also you mentioned before not having displacement there, but really preserving the culture of the place. What, what are your thoughts on it? Can, yeah. is it, can we do it? Will it's it happen? A lot. It's, um, it's a lot. I think, I think what we're uh, really grateful for is that we have a really small team. And so, um, you know, when we met with Kent and the team and heard about the work that was happening, we, th we thought, okay, this can be our, our, our brain, our trust to help us really use data. Because, you know, often it's, it's presented that a community of color, a low-income community, cannot have good parks, good schools, amenities without causing displacement. Mm -hmm. Well, does it have to be that way? What's the data that shows that? So we really asked the team to help us understand what are the levers of displacement? What, um, and then in particular, we're honing in on, on workforce development okay. because bringing jobs to the community is one of the biggest uh, requests. And so how do you assess the skills that a community has? How do you understand what upskilling is possible um, with that, and can you match that with the industries that you bring into the development? So, and then obviously there's housing, which is another piece that we're looking at. So just, you know, how do we break these complex systems down into pieces that help us make the right decisions and then allow us to share some of that information with the community? Yeah, I know for myself, you know, being in some ways a lay person on the team, I'm learning the language and I'm learning about it, but these things are incredibly complex when you see the back end of what's happening. And I like what you said too, Fernando, there needs to be a way to visualize the materials so that you can understand it or you can have conversations around it. And then possibly can there be consensus, you know? So I think looking at that, at that in this project will be interesting to see where this team can get, and then also in other places, you know, in somewhere like Chile to see what might come up. We're still in process of defining sort of the research question that we'll look at there, but I know I'm hearing you now, and we've talked about it before, housing is coming up, issues of equity. Do you have any more thoughts? I mean, what, we'll have plenty of time to talk, but what research could bubble up? Wow, that's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah we are just starting. Uh, we are just trying to find the right person for our teams. So the open of our laboratory is open for if anyone wants to go there <laughs> and work with us. Uh, and I don't know, I think it's, it's difficult because uh, we are just trying to understand the methodology and try to know what are we going to do in the first years. Like uh, the City Lab is like a huge news in mm -hmm. Chile, mm -hmm. everyone is taking attention of what we do. Um, so we need to be careful of what we say and, what we <laughs> and, what, uh, and try to control the expectation of this. Yeah, and you're right, when we start the collaborations, they take so much time. They take so much time to get their initial footing and then to build the teams. Like yeah. you're saying, there's a lot of logistics that maybe sometimes we forget when we're at the end of a project presenting some of the work. but all of these things fall into place to be able to make it possible. And I'm really grateful for you both to be here and to share with us. And as you're talking, like I've said, I'm sure it's echoing what some other folks are hearing. So throughout the day today and in the workshops, I hope that other people have a chance also to interact with you and to learn more from you and, and for us as well to keep learning from you and your organizations and all of the work that you do. So thank you both, we appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, we'll pass to our next panel. So hello everyone, I'm very pleased to be part of this panel here and I'm very pleased to talk to you Hussein, because uh, we have no moderator here, so we will do it by ourselves. <laughs> we also have 20 minutes, uh, 20 minutes and I'm happy to take the time here to talk to you because we have known each other online also, we have had a lot of uh, conversations and talks but we have never talked to each other for a longer time, we, we will do it in public now which Perfect. is great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, my name is Geza and I'm uh, heading this City Science Lab in Hamburg, and I'm also heading another lab, which is 
which calls UNITAC, it's a lab with the United Nations, with UN Habitat in Nairobi. So we do on one hand a lot of citizen engagement, stakeholder engagement. We call ourselves in the City Science Lab a multi-stakeholder lab. So we do work a lot with a lot of different people. And all the tools that we are setting up are really applied in the city. We have a lot of employees working with our softwares, um, setting up a digital twin for Hamburg and, and Germany. And uh, we have a lot of projects that are very uh, concretely implemented to the city. And I think we will speak about stakeholder engagement, citizen engagement here in our, our panel. And on the other hand, I'm also working in a lot of cities in the global south, so big cities, um, mainly in Africa, but also um, trying to set up a project in Guadalajara. We have heard here um, Mayra and uh, Christian speaking about informal settlements. That's my, the other part of my work. And this is, again, another topic when we speak about stakeholder engagement, when, when we go to cities where we don't have data, it's a huge lack of data. We have people who live in a completely different environment. They have really basic, basic issues, basic challenges every day, getting water, getting their kids educated. I think this is very, um, it's very difficult for us also to work there, but also very important, I think, that we transfer our tech and our ideas to other cities who are not well equipped and not well developed in terms of technology. So that's a bit my introduction. Thanks, Kesa. Mm -hmm. uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Hossein Ranema. I'm an associate professor at Toronto Metropolitan University and a visiting professor here at the Media Lab. Um, so glad to be here uh, with uh, our, our, our global team, and I'm also very happy that uh, the mayor of Niagara Falls uh, could join us today to also hear about some of the work that we are doing, uh, not just in Canada, but uh, in collaboration with uh, MIT. Uh, I run a group uh, in Toronto that is very much focused on uh, data and data science. But the way we look at data is that it's this new fabric of creativity and innovation. So we don't want to look at data and use data purely as a technical or an algorithmic phenomenon. But we are building tools and creative tools that anyone, any stakeholder, any citizen can use it to really create new use cases and values for their communities. Um, as, you, as you all know, um, we keep hearing about the power of AI. We keep hearing about the power of data. But if you go to communities, if you go to small businesses and small communities and you ask them to use AI, they are very worried about that. So our goal is to build tools and capabilities and curricular and co-curricular programs so that we can have students and talents that can create tools that anyone can benefit from AI and data. One of the things that we will be talking about today, and it's also part of our workshop, some of you may have heard about a few years ago, Google wanted to build a smart city in Toronto called Sidewalk Labs. That failed, unfortunately. And we have done a lot of research on why it failed. It was a very uh, ambitious, uh, technology-savvy project. And now, based on that lesson learned, we are now trying to do that again. But this time, instead of the data being owned by big companies stored in black boxes and clouds, we are actually storing that data on the community level. We are using that data to allow parents to collaborate and communicate with each other to increase the performance of the academic performance of their kids to increase the vitality of the communities using tools that a lot of them understand. So happy to tell you more, and I think in the conversation with Gesa, we will be talking about that as a framework that we believe in mind, and then we will be hearing about how it's being used in Germany, how it's being used in Toronto, and our goal is that hopefully you can um, you know, review the framework and see if you can apply it to your respective uh, communities. Yeah, maybe we can uh, start talking a little bit of um, something that I thought about yesterday during, during the, the first City Science Day we had here in this room. I'm here, by the way, with a lot of members from the City Science Lab. They're all sitting there in the last row. I see you. <laughs> um, it's not only, I mean, I talk, I talk with the, the voice of all of us. It's just me sitting here. And one thing that I was um, thinking about yesterday was when we, um, when we do citizen engagement, when we use our tools really for solving problems that we have in cities, 
Um, it's a lot about um, do we trust the data? Where does the data come from? Uh, where, how do you calculate the data? What are the data sources? Um, and I see very often that uh, citizens um, are very critical and also stakeholders and experts are very, very critical about the numbers, about the data we use. We've seen yesterday a lot of statistics, a lot of diagrams, and it, sometimes it seemed to be as if they, if, 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 if they were set, as if they were the truth, and that's, it's not. They are culturally made. How are they curated? And my, uh, my um, experience is very often that we, it's, it's, um, it's a problem, it's a challenge, and we get out of this dilemma a little bit when we make it transparent uh, how, we, how we get the data. Is there an urban data platform, for example, that a city has? Is the data public? Then you can always refer to an open data platform. Is it, uh, who runs the, this urban data platform? Is it company data? Is it citizen data? Is it um, data that the authorities create? That's so important. And I think we always, and yesterday I missed a little bit, to be honest, a bit a skeptical or critical perspective on that. I, I never realized where the data came from. Is it big data? Is it only few data? It makes a big difference for me. So I think when we talk about citizen engagement, it's very important to show, to, to create a certain transparency of data. And my experience is also that um, explaining the limits of data is much more important than explaining the magic of data. That's very easy, we can all do it. But explaining the data we miss or explaining that this data is probably not, or it's, it's strange data, but we use it nevertheless, that makes a lot of sense and that creates trust. So trust building is, from my point of view, the most important thing when we talk, talk about stakeholder and citizen engagement. I don't know how your experience is. Yeah, I think it's, 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 you, you said it very well. I remember when I started working on Connected Cities about 10 years ago, I was part of a European-funded research program uh, based in France that built a solution for RATP, the, the Paris Metro Authority. And the way we built that was that we had a very top-down view on how such systems should be created. We had to go to the authority, we had to go to the city, really unify and collect the data and build a centralized system with all the governance, and I don't want to talk about the French public sector at the moment, but it took a very long time for us to be able to bring that capability life uh, for the Paris Metro. Then we did projects in Monaco, we did it in, in Toronto, uh, we partnered with the German company Bosch to, to deploy it globally, but again, the way we went about smart city and data was this top-down, uh, infrastructure-based approach that took a very long time. And if you look at the theme of uh, our, our event, it was not a hyper-local solution. And what we learned was that these things will emerge if you start with local communities with frameworks that they all bring their creativity and co-creativity and let it grow uh, 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 together. Um, so the way we are looking at it now and the projects that we are currently working is if you think about a number of entities that are usually functioning in a modern city, so think about a telecom operator, think about a utility company, uh, think about a bank or a credit union. If you look at your phone at the moment, you perhaps have an app connected to one of these entities, but your data is completely locked behind the secure network of these entities. These entities would love to collaborate with each other, but how impossible would it be to convince them put, to put all that data in one location? It's almost impossible. But think about the new models. I mean, some people call it Web 3.0, some people call it the decentralized internet, but, and with the new ownership of data and the, the, the privacy guidelines, a lot of that data belongs to you now as citizens. So you can now ask these entities to collaborate on your behalf based on the permissions you give them to create new experiences and values for you as part of a, whether it's a digital channel or, or, or an app. So a lot of the work that we are doing now is to introduce these decentralized data hubs in cities with tools wrapped around them so each community, each city can create and co-create things for their needs, for tourism, for uh, improving ESG metrics. Because the challenge we see at the moment, unfortunately, 
the mindset of a lot of cities at the moment when they use data and AI is the mindset of a graduate student in a lab, which says, give me the data and I'll do my project or I write my thesis. That is not possible when you go to the real world. So the investments and the areas that we are focusing on is how do you really manage data portability? Not move the data, but ask questions from the data. Always consult uh, privacy guidelines and permissions and consent from the user, and then you will see that new ecosystems of uh, data-driven creativity uh, will, will, will emerge. And I'll talk about some of the programs that we have now that we introduced that are teaching both undergraduate and graduate students to really understand the philosophy of data and the physics of data rather than worrying about you know, just the algorithmic complexities and the statistical complexities of, uh, of data. And when I looked at um, uh, our, our colleagues' lab in Hamburg, that was fantastic because if you look at their city scope and they bring people together to make better decisions and as you call it, stakeholder engagement, these are great examples that decision-making in cities are not just going to be input-driven based on a paper. You bring people around a creative medium and let them to participate and collaborate around decisions. Yeah, I think you addressed an important issue, this how to create an ecosystem of data in a city. This, this is important, and especially when we, work, when we want to work also with company data, I have the same, had the same experience that you described here very well. Um, and I think the, the, first, the first topic is always having a good data management system in a city which is accessible and um, people should understand it. It should be also designed nicely, which is very often not the case. So we have a lot of cities, they have data management system, they are horribly designed, so people don't use it. Um, and I think, um, again, I would like to um, focus on this, how do we bring the stakeholders together? But because it looks so simple, you have a mapping, you have a, a um, city scope, we have seen the Kendall Square city scope here yesterday, but then bringing the people together, organizing the stakeholder process, who talks to whom about what. We always say that we do that, we curate data, we put them on maps, we put them in a city scopes to foster collaboration. But fostering collaboration is a very, difficult and hard and long-term process, and it's highly political. I give you an example. That it was when I uh, came here to the US some days ago, I got a phone call from the mayor's office in Hamburg, and the mayor said to me, we have to install wind turbines in the city of Hamburg now. It's alternative energy uh, production from wind, and they need spaces in the city of Hamburg to, to locate them. And this is highly political because they, they produce noise, they produce shadow, people want, don't want them in their backyard, but they want to have it in the city, and so on and so on. And he said to me, could we start a stakeholder process? And we are doing it now. It's a, it's a it's a beautiful use case. I like it a lot because it's a very simple use case and people immediately understand why this is very important now for the city. But it's highly complex. Who invites whom? Um, uh, how do we do it? How often? How long are the workshops? What do we do with the results? Do we publish them? Can they be public? Should they be not public? It's everything is super, super political. And we, in our case, in Hamburg, it works so well because we have a lot of support from leadership. Um, it's funny you showed these images for seeing Olaf Scholz was also in Toronto visiting your lab and he used to be the mayor of Hamburg before he became chancellor of Germany. We have never imagined that during that time. And you told him then in Toronto that you are part of the, this network and he was super happy to hear that, that we know each other. And Olaf was, as Scholz was very supportive huh? because he wanted the citizens to, to discuss uh, citizen data. They, he wanted all the stake secretaries to come to the lab and, and use this database decision support systems. And that's important in our case that we have it, and this is why it works so well. Yeah. And I know that in a lot of cities, I had some uh, chats here with other directors from other cities lab. Um, I talked to... Uh, Palo Alto also, and th that's of course uh, the, the crucial thing, that's the point. We can create a lot of technology, if uh, people don't use it, then at the end it's nice, but it's academic. Yeah. <laughs> uh, there are two more things that I kind of want to highlight as, as part of our panel, and we'll be more than happy to continue our conversation. Uh, one is, well, we kind of all know how we want to create these data-driven, vibrant communities. But the question for anyone starting, whether a large corporation or a university or a startup is, well, how? 
from where. We have seen models that are very top-down by some of the largest companies in the world, including Cisco and IBM, that really had challenges scaling. So going directly to the city and part of big RFP processes and all that may not be the right approach. So a lot of the work that we are doing is that, well, how do we start? And some of the work, and some of my colleagues are here that are working on that is, well, first of all, start with the uniqueness and the DNA of that community. See the, the, the hubs and where the hubs are. It, it's not a one-size-fits-all solution. So some of the work that we are doing in, in the US, especially in, in, in more smaller communities, is to partner with credit unions, with banks. Because if you think about the interconnections they have, citizens have a bank account. Um, Small businesses have bank accounts. So that can become a very interesting gateway. And if you think about the new regulations that are coming up, especially some of you may know about open data and open banking, well, that is a huge opportunity. Because as a citizen, I can ask my bank to become my data co-op and use that not just necessarily as a financial hub or a financial exchange, but also as a data exchange to interconnect with the rest of the community uh, and trust them with my data as I trust them with my payroll and my paycheck to manage the data on my behalf. But similar to the fact that I can withdraw my money whenever I want from my checking account, I should have the comfort that I can withdraw my data uh, or delink my data whenever I want. So those are things that we are looking at. What are the perfect gateways to introduce uh, these data hubs uh, in a community? The second and last thing that I want to mention is the education around these new emerging um, capabilities in cities. And those are some of the things that we are working with our uh, colleagues at the City Science Lab and especially at, uh, at the Toronto Lab to introduce new curricular programs. We have a program called the Creative AI Program. It brings students from the design background, from the creativity background, and instead of really complicating things for them in terms of, okay, you really got to learn how a neural network backpropagation works because before you use AI, well, teach them the philosophy of that. Allowing them to differentiate between AI inference models and very quickly allow them to apply it to a particular pain point. So if you bring these two pillars together, we believe that there are going to be a lot of opportunities that, you know, new... Uh, ecosystem models will, will emerge for the new types of communities that we want to see. Yeah, time is already up. It's, it's, Your, it's horrible. Yeah. 20 minutes are short, yeah. right? <laughs> really short. <laughs> so we have to end. Um, I mean, you mentioned this interdisciplinarity, uh, interdisciplinarity of your approach. This is also in our case very important. Uh, and I think one of the ingredients of our success is also that we have like social scientists. We have a lot of like also philosophers, um, designers. We, we, would, we like to bring in more the arts, not for decoration and only for communicating data, but also for really working with us, setting up new ways of storytelling also, also new ways of interactively using our tools. I mean, we like to work with also with analog um, issues, like they do also here in the City Science Lab with Lego bricks or 3D printed little objects. So we like to have this gamification aspect much more on our tools. And um, I maybe my last sentence, I think we already spoke about that indirectly, but use case generation. That's my new passion. I think I will write a book about that now. I just finished my book about data curation and how that leads us to collab collaboration. It comes out now in German at the moment, but then we will also translate it into English. But use case generation is so crucial and I think it's so difficult and I see so much failure in use case generation. Um, because technology is also power. It's an expression of power, and especially when we go to the informal settlements and when we work in the UN context, like Myra here also explained us a little bit, you have a, a huge discussion on, on disbalance, on power, and so on and so on. But even also if, when, we, when we work in our cities, in our high developed cities, use case generation is highly complicated, and I would love to establish a kind of methodology, how we can do it in a good way, listening to each other, really understanding what the other part wants to learn, 
We see it now with blockchain. Blockchain doesn't make any sense, uh, I would say, in city planning. Of course, technical-wise, it's super interesting. It's super easy to create some blocks on processes in cities. But does it really add value to people? This is the question. I, I couldn't came up with a good use case. We have done a lot of workshops on blockchain and DAOs and so on and so on. But so far, it's only interesting from the technical side. But people, they don't need blockchains in city planning or citizens don't need. But I know that this is a provocation, but uh, maybe a topic for the next panel. Okay. Well, thank you so <laughs> thank much. You. And thank you, Geisa. And yeah, thank looking you. forward to continue our conversation. Okay, that was amazing. I feel so fortunate to be able to learn from and explore ideas with this amazing group of researchers from a, around the world. Well, thank you for joining us for the morning's program. Uh, by the way, you can stay in touch with the City Science Network by going to, it's very simple, citysciencenetwork.org. And we're always looking for new collaborators, new ideas, you know, so help us continue to build this network because I'm very excited about it. So now we'll shift our focus uh, to uh, the network workshops. Okay, so we have, um, we will have each node of the network will pre present a, a workshop throughout the day. There's a QR code right on the back of your little name tag. If you scan that, that'll give you the information that you need. It'll, it'll show the agenda for the day, which workshops you've registered for. And we, we, I think there's a really exciting range of workshops today. There's the So City Community Process. Uh, that's a new process for pro-social urban development uh, from the City Science Lab in, in Shanghai and, um, and, and Gesa. They'll talk about blockchain and DAOs, so <laughs> you, you, can, you can tune in if you're interested. Uh, there's uh, using eco-technologies to address food scarcity from the City Science Lab Guadalajara. Uh, I think that's in the far, the far room down there. Co-creation, mixed realities, new ways of capturing curated data from the City Science Lab in Hamburg. We heard a little bit about that. Uh, so we've got a very busy day ahead and at the end of the day we will gather back here to share insights and ideas we'll we'll ask people to report back that'll all happen in this room at 4:40 i think we have just a brief break before the workshop so go out and grab some coffee and some snacks and uh, we'll see you in the workshops thank you, thank you.